Good evening, good evening, and welcome to another edition of Smashing Kidney Disease. I am your host, Steve Belcher. Thank you for watching. How's everyone doing today? We're doing That's good. great. We definitely got a great show for you tonight. Um, I've been seeing this gentleman's poster all over the place on Facebook, um, you know, behind the efforts of Jared and Jeffrey Brown. So without any further ado, I would like to bring on Nick Salter. Hey, Uncle Nick, how you doing? I'm doing well, Uncle Steve. How are you? <laughs> pretty good, pretty good. I uh, see you have your wife with you, Debbie. Yes, my wife, Debbie, of uh, 41 years. Uh, can you ask her to um, bring your face in the picture a little bit? There you go. How you doing, Debbie? I'm doing good, thanks. Great, great. So, Nick, um, let's just get right to it. How did you find out you had kidney disease? How did your journey start? Well, um, I, I would say back in the 80s, I started to have a lot of joint pain. Uh, and I went to the doctor and he prescribed anti-inflammatories, uh, Biox, Relafin. I couldn't go to work. I was coaching and, and I had a difficult time going to work without some kind of relief with my joint pain. And... Uh, after taking it for, I guess, eight or nine years, my doctor noticed that my kidney function was starting to uh, deteriorate. And from that point on, I started to see my uh, kidney doctor, my urologist, uh, nephrologist, excuse me. And uh, it was a number of years. It's, it was really dropping, you know, slowly. But then toward, towards the end, it dropped very quickly, the numbers I'm talking about for the mm -hmm. function. Mm -hmm. So during the time that you were taking the anti-inflammatories and once you saw the nephrologist, did they give you any education or any information to tell you how you could slow the progression or even halt it, halt the progression of going into full-blown stage five? Oh, yes. Yes, my doctor did provide that kind of information to me. And I it did, it did help because the numbers for, for, for the first couple of years did not drop as quickly as they did right at the end. So uh, it wasn't too bad, for at least in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So it mm -hmm. was mainly diet, exercise, and, and uh, certain kinds of, you know, avoid certain kinds of foods and take the medication also. Did you, did you follow... All those recommendations? I'd like to say I followed everything except diet because I like to eat. So that was a little difficult. But I did, mm -hmm. you know, I did follow a uh, majority of the recommendations. Mm -hmm. It did help. How long from the time that you got diagnosed to the time you start actually started dialysis? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I would say, oh, like three years. Maybe three, four years. Okay. 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 And uh, were you taking blood pressure medicine as well? Yes, I was. I was taking blood pressure medicine for, uh, you know, I, ha I also have uh, coronary artery disease. Back in 2011, I had uh, six cardiac bypasses. So, uh, you know, I had, I have to take the medicine, medication wow. for that. Were you on dialysis when you had those six cardiac no. bypasses? No. Did they tell you um, that that could possibly had an uh, impact on your kidney function? Oh, definitely because of the dye that they use and, uh, when they uh, catheterized you. That was one of the issues that they had when it had to be catheterized. Uh, cardiac catheterization, that is. You know, the dyes are no good for the kidneys. They really destroy the kidney mm -hmm. function. Mm -hmm. Did the nephrologist um, approach you before actually starting dialysis to get an access placement? Well, he he educated me on that. He uh, towards the end, I guess the last two or three months, my numbers were just at the point where I could start dialysis if I wanted to, and I held off. He did uh, mention the fact that we're going to have to have it, you know. Uh, an access port put in. And uh, once I made the decision that 
it's time to take dialysis on because I wasn't feeling well at all. Uh, mm-hmm. Then then we moved on from that point on. Yeah, so my, my doctor was, was, was good with that information. Did you start at the outpatient facility or you started in the hospital? Well, I think I, my first dialysis treatment was in the hospital because I had to have the, the port put in my chest. So okay. I, I was there for one or two treatments and then I went to the outpatient facility. Mm-hmm. Were you nervous uh, when you had that having, after, put after, in? After having six cardiac bypasses, no, I wasn't nervous wow. about this. I, I know that I would, I would eventually start to feel better, which I do. But uh, you know, the dialysis does wear you out. Mm-hmm. You know, it's so, just, just just wears your body out for the day, at least. I'm sure. I'm sure. So, Debbie. Yeah. How did your sister Donna get involved with Nick advertising for him to to get a kidney? Well, she's convinced that she's going to get this kidney for Nick. And she met up with uh, Jeff and Jared and they just every day they talk or there's a new post, new videos. Um, She's just going to she's relentless. She Mm -hmm. calls me and wants me to find out information and she just keeps on going. So when did that start for her? When Nick first started dialysis or sometime during the uh, process? No, I would say two years ago. Nick started dialysis two years ago this January. Mm -hmm. And um, I would say probably from there until she met Jeff and Jared, she was writing letters, asking stores, places to post them and um she did that did that for a while Mm -hmm. and then when she met up with jeff and jared you see what they do right right so nick did you ask your sister-in-law to do that for you or she just came to you out of the blue and said this is what she wanted to do for you how did that conversation happen uh i think she just started it on her own because she's that kind of a person she sees a need to do something and she does it. She doesn't wait. And, uh, you know, of course, I was very appreciative of it. And like I said, one of the things we talked about earlier before the show started about going to dialysis and, and, and having what the benefits that I have versus my co-dialysis partners, uh, they don't, most of them don't have an advocate. And I, I'm very lucky to have an advocate and a caregiver. And so... I'm very appreciative of what she does. I nicknamed her my pit bull with lipstick because she's very, very tough. She's very determined, and uh, she'll get an answer. And mm-hmm. put together. Mm-hmm. So does she have access to your medical records, or is she that type of advocate as well, or she's just more of a, um advertisement for the kidney transplant? Well, she has, we give her access to the medical records if she needs it. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. She's all of those things, really. Mm-hmm. She's just, uh, I mean, she started out with, with flyers going to the local stores. Mm-hmm. The good thing about that was every place I went to the store, there was a flyer there for me, and I got free food and free that. No, I'm only kidding. Uh, <laughs> it, was, it was just unbelievable. I was all over town, and everyone seemed to know. And... Uh, then she started with, you know, social media, and uh, it's it's been an explosion. Mm-hmm. I'm very very fortunate to have that because, like I said, a lot of the people that I go to dialysis with don't have that at all. Right. You mentioned that you had a big family. Has anyone from your family offered to uh, get tested? Yes, my children, my sister. Um, what else? My brother. Her, uh, my brother-in-law, mm-hmm. I think that's about it from the family. But they were, you know, all um, denied or, or uh, ruled out. They, their term was ruled out because of health issues that they had. Mm-hmm. Oh, just wanted, uh, something that came to my mind I wanted to ask. Have anybody ever mentioned to you that you look like a gentleman that played on The Sopranos? <laughs> Nate uh, Uncle Junior. 
Yeah, they they've mentioned that. They also <laughs> also my grandkids call me Mister Up with my glasses, the cartoon character. You know, I, I get a lot of that. Yeah. No, but the, you look like the guy from The Sopranos. If you ever watched that show. Oh, I used yeah. to watch that show. We. <laughs> I don't know where where are you coming from. I'm I'm in Baltimore. Okay. I'm from Washington D.C., but I live in Baltimore. Well, Jared, if you watch the show, I mean, I'm sorry, Steve. <laughs> we have Jared, Steve, Steve. Right. If you watch the Sopranos. You would know where they're filmed. They're filmed right in our neighborhood here. Really? Yep. They're all wow. all this area, the the surrounding towns where I where I'm living at right now in northern in northern New Jersey. That's wonderful. And I heard that. The home that you're living in now, you've been there 34 years. It's your wife's original home? Yep. Wow. Yep. Wow. So how many um, dialysis clinics is in your town, Nick? Well, I don't go to one in my town. I actually go to the one that my doctor uh, visits. So I have to travel a little bit. I actually, before... Right nearby me, within about two or three miles, there are at least two clinics that I know of. Right. But I go further out because uh, my doctor goes to the clinic that, that I'm going to now. It's in Montclair, New Jersey. Right. And let me tell you, Nick, you're not the only one that's doing that. I know patients here in Baltimore that travels, you know, 10, 12, maybe 20 miles you know, they pass multiple clinics to go to one where their doctor is. And a lot of times, you know, I tell patients that they have to look at the uh, risk versus the benefits of doing something like that. Because if someone doesn't have transportation and they're dependent on public transportation, and when you have inclement weather, how are they going to get to the unit? especially if they pass in two or three units to go to another one. And I don't know, I have mixed feelings about that because, you know, on one hand, I know you're probably comfortable with your nephrologist, but on the other hand, just the wear and tear and the travel and that whole system makes me think, is it a DeVito or Fresenius that you go to? Fresenius. Yeah, yeah. And there, I mean, it's like that here. You you have patients that, um, you know, go to Fresenius and they may go to the hospital and, you know, the doctors try to pretty much go after that particular patient, especially if that patient has just been diagnosed and whoever's on service or the emergency room calls, whichever nephrologist is on board, and that nephrologist could be from a center, you you know, way out and get that patient and then try to steer that patient to one of their units. Right. Yeah. So um, have you ever thought about transferring or you like it where you go? Well, I've been to other units only because of uh, vacation. Mm -hmm. so I, I kind of like my unit. I like the people. They're wonderful there. I get along with them. I joke with them. Uh, I get to know them very closely. Uh, I know about their families. And they know me. So they walk by and, they, and they'll see, you know, look on my face or something, and they'll be right there to help me. So I really wouldn't want to leave unless I absolutely mm -hmm. have to. But you make a very good point about the weather situation. You know, we had one storm a month or two ago, a month and a half ago, and it was really – Bad. I mean, I got. I just got out of there in time before the snow really hit, and so it is a problem. I, I remember that snowstorm. Yeah, yeah. There's a problem. Um, have you experienced any? I know you mentioned to Jared when you had your interview with him about your blood pressure. Well, let me back up because it was something that you mentioned that it kind of struck me. You had talked about your hemoglobin, which is your blood count. Right. And you had mentioned that yours was running around 10. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it goes, it's gone as low as 10, but 
Uh, once it gets to about 11, I, I get medication for that. I get a medication called Epigen. Right. Epigen. Well, normally, let me just explain how that works. Be, um, so with Epigen, if, if normally here in Baltimore, and this is kind of generalized, but normally what they do when your hemoglobin hits 11, they hold the medication. They, they stop it. And so once your hemoglobin decreases below a certain level, they restart the medication at 25% of the dosage that you was originally getting. So it's pretty much playing seesaw because once your numbers drop down to say 11 is a good number, they don't, they don't want it to go over 11. It used to be 12 but they had dropped it because that medication is so expensive. So once it gets 11, they normally hold it. And when it drops down to a certain point, like maybe 10, they restart it at 25%. They try to maintain it between 10 and 11. But, um, you know, if you can imagine your clinic and all six other thousand clinics, patients getting these medication, this synthetic medicine, that's a lot of medication and a lot of cost. Right. So right now, how do you feel um, far as with the anemia? Are, are you at a level where you feel comfortable and not the symptoms of anemia, such as being tired? Um, I have, uh, I, my, my uh, levels go up and down very quickly. Um, and right now I'm getting epigen because my blood, my uh, blood count went down to, to 11. When it gets to 11, I'm shot. I have wow. a difficult time walking any distance at all without being short of breath, um, fatigued, low blood pressure, dizziness. And I, my, I could tell, I could tell, I tell my wife, I, I bet you my blood count is low. And sure enough, when we check the, the weekly test, it's there. I can tell exactly when it gets to that point. And so right now, I'm just I just started my second dosage of uh, of uh, epigen for this round. And well, let me... it'll, it'll go back up, and hopefully it'll be in the 12 area. When it's in the 12 area, I got like a motor up my butt. I could do so many things. <laughs> right, right. Well, you know, New Jersey may be different, but I can tell you here and, and working as well i don't work as now but i was an administrator and we had to you know watch these you know medications and uh assess patients numbers um 11 i mean 12 for you i mean that's here they wouldn't even give anyone epigen with the hemoglobin of 12. um yeah. that started out with me huh it started out with me i was in the tens and I was a, a basket case. Wow. And eventually, wow. I guess they realized, you know, I, I think everybody's different. I think the numbers. Absolutely. The numbers are skewed with average population. I'm a pretty big guy. So uh, I, I think, you know, maybe it's a little different in bigger bodies. And so. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, Oh, I, yeah, absolutely. Your body weight. I have no energy. Like when I when it's like that, I have no energy. My leg muscles cramp up there's like no oxygen going to the muscles it feels like it's when i used to play football it was like a workout when you did a workout and at the end your legs were so exhausted you couldn't move them. that's what it's like when when i my uh, blood counts are low mm. wow wow um have you seen any short um staff shortages at your unit do they experience that from time to time no, they're they're well staffed. Wow. Yeah. Okay, that's great. That's they're great. Very well staffed. Um, I, I see different people. They come from different units. Every so often, like maybe when I go in on Thursday, there'll be a, a group different than today. Mm -hmm. Some are similar, but some of them tra go back and forth between offices. There's there's actually two units for Sinius's in Montclair where I go and they're very close to each other. Mm -hmm. So they, they kind of share staff. Yeah. 
you know, you know, I'm a dialysis nurse, um, but what we generally do, you have uh, techs and nurses uh, work for both companies, Davida and Fresenius, and they go back and forth between doing, uh, they may be full time with Davida and do part time with Fresenius right. and, you know, interchangeably back and forth. Now, did you know about kidney disease before it actually you found out about it? Well, in the late 80s, when my doctor told me that my urine had blood in it, and, you know, this is a sign of kidney disease, yeah, I looked it up. I was a health teacher, in high, you know, high school health teacher. I looked it up, and, and I'm like, I'm not going to get kidney disease. I'm going to be fine. And, uh, of course, I was wrong. So, wow. uh, yeah, I, I knew about it. I, I kept the breast of it. Um, and unfortunately, I'm, I'm a mini expert right now, but it's on the other side of that uh, table that I'm getting. Mm -hmm. So was it hard changing your diet from what you used to eat to a Reno diet? Uh, yes and no. I, you know, you, some certain things I just crave. Um, I, I just, I crave a Coca-Cola. That's that's all I'm. That's all I really crave—a big glass of Coke, and you know you're not supposed with the phosphates. You're not supposed to take it. Um, there's certain kinds of foods I miss, you know, certain processed foods that that you kind of stay away from. It wasn't it wasn't as bad as I thought, but mm -hmm. you know, I just uh, I've been doing pretty well, keeping my dry weight at where it is. My numbers are really good, um, and taking my blockers. So. That's uh, that that's that's been helping me a lot. Mm -hmm. Now, does your sister-in-law Donna, does she live near you, in the same area? She lived. She used to live in this house, but she lives uh, maybe uh, twenty miles away. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Now, since working with Jared and Jeffrey, how, how did that that union come about i know you said your your sister-in-law uh introduced you but you're not on facebook are you no i don't i don't go on facebook i i just I, that to, that's not something i'm interested in i you know I, I do have an account but i don't really use it um i just find as a as a high school teacher i found more kids getting in trouble with social media postings and things like that, that, you know, I, I was an advocate not to be on that and get himself in trouble. So it, I'd be kind of a hypocrite if I go on it now and, and use it. So I, anything I need to know, I, I go through either Debbie or Donna or anybody else in the family that's on it. Right. So you don't know how uh, your sister-in-law's posts are doing. You just get word from her or your, or your wife of how well it may be shared or how many people responded to it. Well, what did you tell me today? She, yeah, she tells us how many people we don't see all that information, but according to her, I don't know. His page has a lot of followers. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. That's wonderful. Yeah. So have you received a call since, uh, are you on the, tra you're on the transplant list? Of course. So have you ever received a call yet? Um, no, it's too early yet. They, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's five to seven years in New Jersey. Say that again. The, the wait is five to seven years. So it's right. But for me. I, I've seen people start dialysis and I know we're not in New Jersey, but I've seen people start and wasn't on a year. And of course, they got on the transplant list before they got on dialysis, and they got a call. Yeah, I, I didn't get a call. You know, I, I I haven't gotten a call, and I don't intend. I don't anticipate getting one for at least another two years or so. So, did your nephrologist talk to you about um, getting on the list before dialysis? Yes, and I did. I started it um, maybe two months before dialysis. Oh wow! Okay, yeah. okay. So yeah. you—that's—that's a, that's a job in itself. Getting on, getting past all the tests, 
and the interviews and all that. That's that's like a job interview almost. <laughs> <laughs> How long did that process take you? Uh, I would say a couple of weeks with uh, the testing. You know, you have the the initial um, four hour interview meeting, and then you have to go back for a few tests here and there, get the results, and then go back and meet with them again. So it's it, it takes a it takes a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of uh, times people don't realize that um, those who are interested in donating. Oh, I have your blood type. Oh, it's going to be a one, two, three. No, it takes a couple of weeks for them. The same thing for them to to get through to become a, a living donor for that, you know, for a person. So people don't understand. It's not a, you know, a one, two, three. Here we go. This, we'll have it done at the end of the week. You know, it's, it's mm-hmm. it takes time. Now, did you have to go through a psych evaluation? Yes. I'm a little crazy anyway, but I, I was okay. <laughs> I, I, I had I told them I had too many concussions and they were they let me go. No, I'm mm-hmm. joking. I'm joking. Right. <laughs> now, do you think the anti inflammatory drugs has something to do with um your kidney disease? Absolutely. Because that's the only thing that uh was was showing up on the test with my doctor. And I don't blame my doctor. I mean, I, 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 I had a physical job. I was a head coach of football, head coach of track. I was a phys ed teacher. So I had, a, I had a physical job from when I got there till I went home, you know, constantly moving. I needed to have something because I had so many problems with my upper back and my legs because of football, college football, that uh, I couldn't go to work. So I had to go to work. I had young kids. And so this was these were the drugs that are out there. One of them, Vioxx, I don't even remember. They took it off the market because it was so absolutely. Dangerous. And you I know what? That. When they took it off the market, I cried because that was the best drug for me. That really took away the inflammation of the joints. I felt good. I was able to go to work. I actually cried when they couldn't get any more Vioxx. Yeah, but the the side effects of that was I don't think was worth the risk. Right. Yeah. And that's that's how it is with a lot of these medications that are out on the market now. Every week you turn on the TV, you're hearing about a new drug for uh, diabetes type two when that's preventable, and it, it, it's just it's just you know ridiculous. Yeah. So, um, no, you haven't received any calls or n- nothing. Since Donna started the campaign, no one stepped up to say uh, I'll get tested or anything. Well, we've had, like I've said, we've had a few, mm-hmm. but we don't know. We we really don't know anything. They won't tell us anything. I did have one one interesting call. Uh, I would say, I guess six months ago or so, I got called on a Friday afternoon. Uh, they needed they needed a uh, tissue typing, and I said, well, they take it all the time. Somehow it didn't get in, and apparently there was an anonymous donor uh, that I had to run to the hospital, give a sample of blood, and and see you know if we were a match. We were a match, but however that person was quickly ruled out. So I did have one exciting period of time where uh, you know you get a call, but it but it was it was it was ruled out you know pretty quickly. Did they tell you why I was ruled out? They won't tell you anything. No. Won't tell you female, male, relative, cousin, neighbor, nothing. They tell you nothing. Mm-hmm. And that drives you crazy because uh, right. you want to know. Now, when you went through the transplant process for evaluation, did any mention come up about uh, receiving a compromised kidney? Just recently. I was uh, talk about that just just recently in our support group. We have we go to a kidney support group in the next county and uh, they mentioned it. Uh, I think it's the hep C transplants, if I'm getting it correctly, uh, that they're now uh, considering people are considering those kind of organs from from donors who have hep C, hepatitis C. 
Mm-hmm. So I don't know how I feel about that. I haven't really thought about that. But yeah, we're going to be doing a show on that uh, called Compromise uh, Organs because that has been another option that uh, they have been offering patients hepatitis C infected kidney. So, um, you, you know, that's a personal choice and, and, you know, matter for one to make that the decision, especially, you know, one been on dialysis for 10, 15 years and they have that opportunity to do that. So I was just wondering if that was offered to you uh, as well. Not yet. Not at this time. No. Mm-hmm. Have you experienced any cramping or any of that uh, while on dialysis? <laughs> All the time. I they I cramp up about almost an hour to the time I get off. You know, they, that's a joke. They they said, you know, my my uh, technician today came by and says, "Are you cramping yet?" I said, "It's too early." She goes, "It looks." She goes, "Okay." And almost an hour every time I start to cramp, my fingers cramp, my legs, my arms sometimes, and it's very painful. Now, have they investigated or done any interventions to to figure out, you know, why you may be cramping, like adjust your dry weight or, yeah, um, they, yeah, they, or don't pour like you may pour too quickly, so. For instance, say if you're going to take off 2,500, instead of taking off 2,500, take off 2,000 yeah, or, or 1,500 because you may pour a lot harder than a lot of other people. Well, recently the problem I had was last year I got real sick. I got a blood infection. I lost a ton of weight. Mm. So I, went, I went down from uh, like 130 kilos to 115. So okay. 118, something in that range. Mm-hmm. So um, they adjusted my dry weight to that, and they've kept it there, you know, for a long time. And I was struggling because I was never meeting my goal. And I kept saying, I, that's not my weight. My weight is, you know, right now it's it's uh, 123, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm doing really good with that. I can maintain that. But, mm-hmm. you know, when they had it down to 119, 120, 121, 120, I struggled, and uh, I remember the last time before they adjusted my dry weight this time, I was a one big cramp trying to get out of there, you know, trying to get to my car, you know, worried about getting a cramp while I'm driving home. So, but now it's been working out pretty well. But I, the cramps I have now, they're they're minor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, what type of access do you use for kidney dialysis? I have a fistula. Do we? Would you mind showing that to us? Well, it's bandaged up. I can't. Oh, okay. Don't worry about. It. I see it. It's not not ready to take off yet, as you know. Right, right. I would I would do the Julia Child uh, routine where she cut herself in blood. You don't want to see that. Right now, what size needles do you use? I don't know the size, but I think they're the biggest size, and they actually remind me of. Uh, because I'm a woodworker, they actually remind me of the, the the brads that I use to to put molding on around a window or something like that. They're pretty big. I try not Maybe to like look. Fifteen gauge. I think they're in that range. Yes. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Um. Do they do a lot of education at your unit? The technicians do they come by and, and tell you, um like what your blood flow rate is and your dialysate flow and what size kidney you're on and maybe how much blood thinner you get? Not, not most of that. No, they don't tell me most of that. They'll tell Are me you that. aware of that? If I guess I could be, if I've asked, I, I just, you know, I'm not, I, I, that to me is not something that I need to know. I, I just trying to get through the, the four hours of dialysis. So I don't ask that question, but if it's something I should be asking, I will. No, well, let me, let me, let me just say this, Nick. Um, just being a dialysis nurse, that's something you definitely need to know. And the reason why, because you have mentioned that different people come to your unit to work. 
So if if you don't know these people from Adam, if somebody come there one day and they're looking at your orders that's on top of the machine that set the machine, right. they may program your prescription that the doctor writes. They may, I mean, we're human. And so if you're supposed to be on a 450 pump speed when it's lab day and they have you on 400 or 350, that's doing you disservice, especially <laughs> if you don't know, if you don't know that you're supposed to be on 450 blood flow rate and you're running on 400 or 350, I mean, that's a problem. You you need to know that. I mean, and I mean, you know, you didn't know, but from this point, you should you should get to know your prescription. So because for instance, if you're if your potassium, I'm just using this as an example. If your potassium is high, let's just say the dietitian came to you and say, Nick, your potassium is is high this week, or you know, the blood test. And you trying to they trying to figure out why you have it. And say you have consecutive high potassiums and they can't figure out why you're having it. You know, they try diet. Next thing they're gonna try is the special bath. If you have a high potassium, then they're gonna have a special bath on your machine, like a 1K, a low potassium bath, so it wouldn't add to increase the potassium in your blood. So if you're in a 1K bath or one potassium bath, and somebody doesn't pick that up and put you on the regular bath as everyone else, and you already have a high potassium, you just never know. And one of the contraindications with dialysis that people don't look at and realize is tachycardia, um, cardiac arrest. So you don't want your potassium, if it's already high, you want to make sure you're on a low potassium right. bath. So if you just go into your unit and you just let the treatment, you just lay it on the hands of the caregiver. I mean, to air is human, you know, humans make errors too. So I just wanted to, do, I'm not going to turn this show, you know, the rest of this show into an education segment, but that's just something you and your wife should know. So I hey, know you, I, I know you trust me. these guys. I know you trust these guys and they like family, but at the end of the day, Nick, your life is more important than anything else. And making sure that you're run on the right prescription, that everything is right so nothing happens, that's very important because anything can happen at the cl you know, click of a hand, something can happen. There's no gray areas in dialysis. One minute you can go there for three years and everything is working great. And then one day you go and you cramping like crazy. You want to know how that happened. So just please, um, if you can learn your treatment, just ask the like it's a treatment shape that they should have. But what percent is they use the computer. They use the um, I can't think of the software they use, but they touch the machine with their hand where they put it in the machine. So but. You are, uh, you know, you do have that right to know your treatment prescription. That's in your um, uh, patient rights and responsibilities um, when they give you when you go in, um, when you first sign up for dialysis in that admission package. So, well, I do have, I do have my prescription here, you know, someplace in this house, just in case I do go away. Right. I do right. Have so I do have all those numbers in there. I just I just don't know them off the top right. of my head. Right. I mean, please, if you ever want me, you know, want me to explain it to you off, you know, off camera. I mean, feel free. You have my number. You and your wife are more than welcome to reach out to Thank me you. if you have any questions of this. I've been doing this 33 years, 10 as a technician, and um 23 as a nurse and that's all i that's all i know is dialysis man that's all i know right so i'm very passionate about it especially when it comes to these big companies because now these big companies in a lot of the major urban cities they're they're starting to skyrocket and i mean they're being built so fast that they can't staff them so 
it's just I'm glad that your unit is not affected by this, but you know, in the rest of the world, this disease is is wreaking havoc on a lot of people. Right, I can understand that. I mean, mm -hmm. my my unit's uh, it's pretty big, uh, but I've been in a, a unit uh, on vacation. It's like almost twice the size. So I and I I could see how it could be very difficult to staff it. Right. Um, have you traveled? You said you were going vacation. What um, parts of the country have you went and done dialysis? Uh, I've been to Florida, uh, outside of Fort, uh, Fort Lauderdale, uh, and uh, I go down to New Jersey Shore. And so I, 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 I've been to two other places other than the Fresenius here and, of course, the hospital. So people, so for some people who may, you know, just started dialysis and think they can't travel, you can not travel, right? And, yeah, you and, can travel. And do this. It's a little bit of work. You have to plan ahead, but like anything else, you just plan ahead. I mean, uh, you, once you once you start this dialysis lifestyle and you get used to it, it's your life is planning ahead all the time. You know, you can't make commitments. You got oh, what day is that? You know, oh yeah, I'd like to go to that party. What day is that party? Oh, I can't go. It's dialysis day or something. So you really have to uh, plan ahead, and it gets easier. And mm -hmm. we have people in our our building our facility that all I do is give her the dates, fill out a form. They contact the place and it's all arranged, you know, and it's really easy. It's not, that, it's not as hard as people think. The only thing mm -hmm. is that you really, I would, you could, but I wouldn't go out of the country for a diet. Mm -hmm. I would just stay within the continental United States. Nick, Nick when you first did your first trip away from your unit, were you nervous? Uh, yeah, I'm nervous to, to find how, how this facility is going to work. And then once you get in there, the people are just so nice that, uh, they treat you with kindness and, you know, you, you just feel really good at, you feel at home. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I go to the one, I go to the one down the shore. We, we have a small place down New Jersey shore. We go down there a lot. And they know me by my first name. I know them by their first name. They, have, you know, we, we're pretty good. I mean, I, and I, I'm not there a, a lot, but I'm there. You know, maybe uh, throughout the year, maybe three weeks at a time. You know, in a total time, and uh, you know, I get to know those people, so they're pretty nice. Wow, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. <clears throat> now, have you experienced any serious complications during dialysis? Since being on dialysis, yes. I say, last, I, I mean, last year, last year I had a blood infection. Don't know how I got it, but of course I had a port, and I was transitioning from the port to uh, the uh, fistula, so I, I got really, really sick. I mean, I was sick, uh, and of course I have a knee replacement, and it got infected, so I had to have that taken out. And have no knee in my knee joint for about 14 weeks, and then I had to have a new knee replacement put in. So it was a mess for six months, I would say, six or seven months. That that uh, the blood infection really did a number on me. Wow. How long, Nick? How long did it uh, take you to get used to dialysis when you first started? It took a while. It, it takes a couple months to to get used to it, to understand what you, you know, what what you got to do, and how to get comfortable there. You know how how to make yourself comfortable and, and and getting into a routine. So it probably takes about a month or two for that to happen. Mm -hmm. I would say. Mm -hmm. Have Have your sister in law visit you at the clinic since no, you they, started treatment? They she has, but very rarely because. They frown upon that. They don't want to bring people in, you know, unless it's necessary. They don't really, they don't, they don't discourage visitors, but they don't encourage it at all. So. My sister, why, why is that? I would, I would guess for infection, risk of infection. You know, uh, there's some people that, that don't have a fistula. They got a port and they, 
you know, they don't want they don't want them to uh, get infected. So I I would guess I would guess it's because of that, which I don't mind because really just what it's really it's really depressing. You know, looking around when you look across, you see a person in a wheelchair coming in, a uh, person in a, in, in a stretcher, uh, person has no too old has no opportunity to get uh, a transplant. So it's it is depressing. I, I wouldn't want people to see that. Right, right. That's 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 understandable. Um... Yeah, you know, when you started mentioning what you mentioned, I started thinking over my career of the many people that I met and and cared for. Um, wow. Um, it was something I was going to say, and it, it, it slipped my mind. Well, one thing I want to mention about visitors, uh, I'll never forget when I had my uh, uh, bypasses, uh, going back to 2011, I had a visitor, uh, and that time I was still working. I had a visitor, a friend came, came by to see me in the hospital. And at that time, I was getting a transfusion. And it's, you know, transfusions similar to the, the blood tubes that you see in dialysis. And I'll never forget, they walked in the room, and they saw the, the tube of blood, and they almost passed out. So I would say that most of the people that I know, especially my son, if they came in and saw me, on the dialysis machine with the, the tubes of blood going in and out, they would probably hit the floor. Right. Have you been approached on doing home dialysis? Yes, all the time. They ask you all the time. They'll have a they'll have like a little display in the lobby every you know every couple months, and they'll they'll try to you know give you the information you need. They're not pushy, but they'll try to get you to. Uh, uh, you know, to at least try to think about it. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. Wow. Wow. Uh, mm. Okay. Now, I was looking at a comment that I'm going to have to block somebody. But anyway, um, have have you decided to make that, that choice on doing that? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to stay with the the, the, you know, the, going to the center. I, I, I don't want to do home dialysis. I think it's just, there's too many risks there. I have trouble right now with blood pressure. Um, so I really want to be there when I have people that can help me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, during the past uh, holiday, did the clinic do anything for the patients? Um. Your lunch. Yeah, they have they they have they have provided lunch. We've had a picnic in the summertime. Uh, they have uh, they they try to do uh, different things. Uh, they just gave away some gift cards for those patients who have had perfect attendance. Uh, they're always doing positive things like that. Yeah, every every so often they're doing that. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So, Nick, as we kind of winding down to the end of the broadcast, I just wanted to ask you, the journey that you've been on up to this point, someone who's watching now who may be starting dialysis or getting ready to start in the next few months, can you share any uh, words of wisdom or encouragement about this journey? Just so they know they're not, a, they're not alone. They have a lot of people that are in the same situation as they're in, having the same feelings, anxieties, and worries. Uh, just try to, first of all, get yourself on a transplant list, maybe multiple lists, and also try to advocate for yourself or get someone to advocate for you. And uh, be very humble and appreciative of all the people who work to help you. That's the one thing I, I always tell the, my technicians and nurses they're saving my life every time i go in there and i always thank them and, and show appreciation so mm -hmm. that's those are the advices i would give people that are just mm -hmm. starting out is there is there anything that you would like to say to your sister-in-law donna why why you had the opportunity uh she's a hero i mean no one would do what she does she's she does this almost 24 7 she only sleeps because she has to 
she's been online in the uh, you know three or four o'clock in the morning. Uh, but I, I have to say, I have, I really appreciate her, appreciate my all my family. Uh, they've been very helpful. My wife, mm -hmm. my wife, my caregiver. I, I tell her all, all the time, I can't thank her enough, and I probably wouldn't be alive today without her help. So, uh, you know, you gotta, you gotta be thankful, humble, and appreciate whatever people do for you. Mm -hmm. even, mm -hmm. if it's, even if it's a, a phone call or, or a text or something like that. Is there anything you want to say to Jared and Jeffrey while you have the opportunity? I'm amazed at, at all the people that they have been able to be in contact with. And again, uh, they don't know me other than starting out with, with Donna, the information Donna gave me, gave them. And they, you know, they treat me like I, I've been their best friend for, for a lifetime. So I really appreciate what they do in, in helping me and, and also helping others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Do you think you ever meet them in person? Someday I would like to. Yes. Someday. Wow. Wow. Okay, man. That sounds great. So what does the future hold for you? Well, I'm hoping that soon I'll get some good news. I'm hoping that through this broadcast, I'll get a I'll get a call tomorrow asking how can I sign up to become a, a donor. Um, I'm going to continue working uh, with the New Jersey Sharing Network and helping with organ donations and uh, volunteering for that. And I'm hoping that I get a kidney for 2020 because New Jersey is hosting. Uh, the uh, transplant games, and I want to be able to participate as a, as an athlete at those games. So I'm, I'm looking forward to to that. Those are that that's my goal, at least in the short range. Wow, that's wonderful. Someone had just mentioned uh, uh, Michael DeBay. I'm sorry if I pronounced your last name wrong. He said meet at the uh, transplant games. And so you just mentioned that it's going to be in New Jersey this year. Yeah, for pretty 2020. 2020. Wow. It was in wow, New that's New great. New Maybe New I may come up there. That's close to Baltimore. Yeah, it's, it was in Salt Lake City uh, uh, last year, last summer. And right. The summer of 2020, in July 2020, it'll be at the uh, MetLife Stadium where uh, Giants and Jets play. The American Dream. What's that? They're building a new complex. It's called the American Dream. It's going. Oh, to be okay, okay, and that's where they're going to hold it from, right across from the Jets and Giants. Yeah. Wow, that's wonderful. All right, Mr. Nick. Well, we appreciate you and Donna. I mean, Debbie. I'm sorry, right. I get both your names mixed. Don't worry about that, Jared. We we. <laughs> <laughs> we we'll, we'll get it straight. Don't worry about it. No. We want to thank you for taking the time and allowing us to interview with you tonight, too. Oh, thank, thank you, you uh, Debbie and Nick, for taking the time out of your schedule and doing this. I know you had treatment today, and I'm, I'm really honored for you to come on, you know, after going through your treatment and, you know, just taking this, you know, period out to share your story. And definitely, you know, we'll share all of Donna's posts advertising for your. Uh, transplant. We'll definitely do all we can to help uh, promote, you know, for you. Right. I, I, again, thank you very much. And I, we want to thank all the followers for all the likes, the prayers, um, just the high numbers that are watching this. All right. All right. Sound good, guys. Well, thanks again. We'll talk to you soon, Nick. Okay. All right. Thank all you. Right. See you, Debbie. Thanks a lot. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Yeah, guys, uh, thank you for, for watching this show. But uh, let me just say this. Uh, we're getting ready to do Sisters Against Kidney Disease, but we are not going to tolerate any, uh, you know, vulgar language or any signs of that. And, you know, I was monitoring the, uh, the dialogue that was going on, and we will uh, handle the situation. 
behind the scenes. So I'd just like to apologize to anyone who's watching this broadcast that uh, was uh, offended. I'm not going to call any names. Y'all, you know, witness the interaction, but uh, I would like to personally uh, apologize for any of that type of behavior. We don't condone it. We don't tolerate it. This is for a platform to uh, promote positive energy, um, getting your story out. So I uh, ask you to stay tuned. Coming up is Sisters Against Kidney Disease with Sorrell. We're going to have on Tracy Tittle. Uh, thanks for watching Nick Salter's interview. Thank you, Donna, for linking us up. Thank you, Jared and Jeffrey, for uh, bringing this to our attention. We look forward to seeing you all next week at Smashing Kidney Disease. Thanks again. God bless and good night.